Okay. Does it work? Okay. Language and evolution. Um, these two fields have uh, intertwined history. As many of you know, uh, historical linguistics, in particular the history of Indo-European languages, directly inspired Darwin um, and to work out the theory of natural selection. Uh, I have a quote here. I, I, don't, I won't read it. I assume you are all familiar with it. Uh, but since then, I think the um, biology and linguistics have developed uh, you know, very far along. But I think nowadays, biology probably has a higher prestige than linguistics. That's somewhat unfortunate. Um, and one of the reasons, I think, is that evolution, evolution biology, has made tremendous progress because it laid out a mathematical or quantum foundation of, of, of biological change. That is the theory of population genetics. Okay? Linguistics has also made a, a lot of progress. We now have very predictive models of linguistic structures, but we haven't really developed a, a comparable set of mathematical theories of change. And that's sort of what I want to do here. Uh, phylogenetic methods have been applied to language uh, sometimes with great fanfare, but it's interesting to note that the very earliest uh, methods developed for uh, phylogenetics actually came out of uh, quantitative studies of, uh, of historical linguistics by the work of uh, Peter Buhlmann um, in, in the 1970s. As also, as was well known, um, when you use those methods, uh, you have this property of junk in and junk out. If you don't give those, me those algorithms uh, sufficiently good data, you get ridiculous results. Uh, some recent exchange in science um, have shown um, very vividly. Okay, so what I want to show today is the following. Um, I want to develop um, a set of models for, for language change that addresses the issue of language variation and change, of course. And the point here is that are there an, any general principles of, of language change? And if so, are these properties of UG or interfaces or something even more general? So that's one goal. The other goal is to develop um, something like the modern synthesis of language change. And this is very much like um, the population genetics research, and uh, as, so this is different from phylogenetics. Phylogenetics, if you take the output of language change, you try to infer what, um, you know, how languages are related. Um, the, the models of change I'm more, you know, interested in is that we take what's known about language and about language acquisition, about language processing, we try to come up with models that can predict language change, or uh, in more realis uh, in realistic terms, how we can explain why some attested changes are actually uh, inevitable. Okay. Um, so this is a very you know, familiar picture that guides the, the intuition between um, um, to study the parallels between biological change and, and language change. I won't dwell on this. You have a grammar and you, know, you talk and that's the input to the next generation and you learn and, the, and then you go on. Okay. Um, if you look at historical linguistics you, uh, broadly, you see two kinds of changes. One is very familiar, the other is actually quite recent, um, quite recently discovered. Okay? One kind of change is that, as in many cases of syntactic and morphological change, language users are essentially bilingual. You have two competing systems, you know, um, you know, if you will, and that can be viewed as the probability distribution of, say, two grammars, so that, uh, that, that distribution changes over time. And in many cases, the change can drag out for hundreds or, or possibly even a thousand years. It's apparently in some cases in what order change in classical Chinese. Um, and this is something that we get to understand a little better more recently, thanks largely to the work initiated by my colleague, Bill LeBob. Uh, phonemic change can happen very rapidly. I'll show you some you know, dramatic examples. Uh, sometimes two or three years. Okay? And so this is something... Um, you can think of this as the learner is exposed to a mixture of two, say, two different you know, phonetic, phonemic systems, and they learn one of them, rather than learning a probabilistic distribution over the two. And that makes sense. Um, there's no penalty in having a rule of two different ways of saying the same thing, but it is somewhat you know, peculiar to assume you, you have half of a, a phoneme. Right? Um, so here's a classical case of gradual change um, in syntax. So here you, you see a single you know, speaker is essentially bilingual, having a, a info final and also info medial um, you know, grammar on two adjacent sentences in a text. 
Um, this is more recent, at least more recently discovered, um, phonemic change. There's a very famous uh, you know, variety of American dialects called the cod, cod merger. Uh, I have some merger, so for me the two vowels are the same. But the two vowels here, for many you know, speakers of, of American English, are different. They're certainly different in the UK. But many you know, speakers of American English actually treat the two vowels you know, the same thing. The very interesting um, uh, uh, fact of, of this is this, this has happened at adjacent uh, you know, areas. So Massachusetts um, is a very solidly merged area. So if you're in Boston, the two vowels are the same. But in Rhode Island, has traditionally been a distinct system. So there, the, the two vowels of cod and cod are actually different. Okay. Dan Johnson, a, a recent graduate at Penn, went to some of the, of the neighboring towns and he found that um, if you take, so this is one family, so if you take the parents and you take the F1 and F2 measures and take the absolute value of the, of the difference, you can see they're very, very different. And that's even true for, you know, for teenagers. But if you look at a nine-year-old, the two vowels are essentially the same. Okay, so I hope you can hear the audio. Okay. Okay, so here's Tom. Cod. Cod. Sorry. Cod. Cod. Different? Here's the mother. Cod. Cod. Different? Here's the, um, the older sibling. Cod. Cod. Here's the younger one. Cod. Cod. Okay? <laughs> this, hap this happens in two or three years. Uh, so you really are seeing two different kinds of uh, you know, uh, change patterns. That's, that's presumably ultimately uh, due to the differences in syntactic and, and you know, phonemic systems. So this is what I'm going to do today. Today I'm going to try to develop a chain, model of change via, uh, through transmission that more or less functions like the basic model of natural selection. And then we'll look at a one particular case of the change in word order in extending some earlier work, um, the change in uh, word, uh, word order in French. That takes a long time to, you know, to work. And then also a more recent one, namely this cod cod merger. In both cases, we'll show that you can actually predict uh, when uh, the change is going to occur, how long it's going to take the, the, the change to actuate in the population, and, uh, and, and, and eventually why this change had to occur. Okay, um, and this is interesting. Um, many years ago, I taught, offered a class on the evolution of a language uh, when I was teaching at Yale, and the first time I offered it, the first day, 350 people showed up. Um, and uh, then I showed them the equation of mathematical biology, and only 60 people stayed. <laughs> but we have to do this, okay, because otherwise we're not even in the game. Okay. So here's the basic model of natural selection. Let's say you have two genes or two competing you know, variants, call them big A and small A, it could be red eye or green eye uh, you know, in fruit fly. And they make up the proportion of P and Q in a population, so percentage of P and Q. And let's say, for whatever reason, the red eye, uh, big A is slightly better. Okay? And uh, let's say it has a thinness of 1 or 1 minus S, by which I mean, uh, in nature, the, the thinness differential is usually very small, but this is something you can do in a lab you can blast them with a gamma ray and measure the body counts afterwards, or you can go out in, in a natural environment and, and count um, the, the frequencies of those variants after a drought or uh, you know, after rain and so on. So that's something you can quantify. As we'll see, we'll do the same for language. And then, um, then you basically develop the model of change mathematically. It's very interesting that these models were developed well before um, we understood anything about the genetic structure. Because so we're talking about genes um, in very abstract terms, and it worked. I think by the same token, we can actually talk about parameters abstractly and still get the models you know, to work, even though we may not know exactly what the, those parameters actually are. Okay, so here's a basic model of natural selection. You have to, in one generation, they're at the proportion of uh, P and Q. And then after selection, um, of their thinness of being 1 and 1 minus s, you got big A being p, but small a being q minus s, so clearly q is going to get smaller. And next generation would be simply you rewrite this equation, right? And if you plot this curve over time, you get this beautiful s-shaped curve. And that's the basic model for natural selection, as we'll see. That's basic model, uh, that's basic pattern of language change as well. 
So what we need to do here is instead of having this very abstract or biological model of transmission, we actually put linguistics you know, into it and put the language acquisition process into this, um, you know, into this transmission process. So this is something I developed when I was in, in graduate school, something called variational learning. I have to take the, the following form. Let's say you have the learner has two grammars, big A and small a, and they have probability of P and Q in their minds. And these grammars may be innate, these grammars may be constructed, it doesn't matter for the mathematics to go through. Um, and upon, if you hear a token, an uh, input token in the environment, you pick big A with the probability P, you pick small a with the probability Q, and afterwards you try to see if it works. If it works for the input token, you increase, increase its probability by some amount, and otherwise, and uh, uh, if, if one guy goes up, the other guy you know, you know, would have to come down. If it doesn't work, you penalize it by decreasing, uh, decreasing its probability. I should say that this is a very general learning scheme. These guys are actually behaviorists. They use this to model how rats run mazes. Okay? So this is a very general learning process. And I, I won't dwell on the details here, but um, it has some, uti has some utility in accounting for parameter setting. Um, that's, that's not for today. Okay. So what's the notion of thinness um, in, in this scheme, in this competition-based learning scheme? Well, that's very easy to do uh, you know, for a linguist. So that's something you can quantify. It's the probability with which a grammar clashes with the input. So what's the probability of a grammar fails in the particular linguistic environment? That's something that we linguists can estimate in a corpora. Okay, so let's say the learner is juggling between the V2 grammar and, and, and SVO grammar. And if you're trying to see how those two grammars fare in the SVO environment, you simply count the percentage of sentences that will be consistent with one and cons inconsistent you know, you know, with the other. You get two numbers. That's between 0 and 1. Okay, so let's say these numbers are C of big A and C of small a. And this holds. If you let the, let the learner run for a while, this is true. Okay, I won't dwell on the, on, on the, on the mathematics here. So after you let your running go for a while, the learner converges on a stable combination of two grammars. And the two grammars, the weights are exactly you know, specified by how likely is a grammar penalized in the environment. Okay, so in most cases that we study, we have uh, cases of language acquisition. You assume there's a more or less monolingual in the environment. So you have a target grammar, you have a pretender. Okay, the target grammar never fails by definition. The pretender fails some of the time. So, um, oops. Um, so one of those values is going to be you know, zero for the target and the other one would be non-zero. So it's clear to see that the target grammar will have a probability of one after learning. You learn a grammar. That's a general case. Uh, that's, well, you know, that's a special case. But if the language environment is a heterogeneous, this is typically the case in language change, well, then they will combine to, they will converge to a stable you know, combination of the two within one generation. Okay? And that's, that's, that's language change, right? So the question is um, that, of course, when you have a homogeneous environment, uh, you need the environment to be altered in order for change to happen. Right? So it's a very interesting question to see how some new variant is introduced. It could be language contact. It could be learning error. It could be anything. And that's what's known as the actuation problem in historical linguistics. That's not something we can usually answer, okay? Because who knows what happened, you know, 600 years ago? But this is something we can answer: is that uh, what happens after some new variant has been introduced? Can we predict whether this new variant can knock out the old one, or this new variant would, you know, will peter out, you know, after a while? And that's the basic model here, okay? So let's say. You have one generation of speakers, and they have they are essentially bilingual. They have grammar A with probability P, and grammar is big A probability B, small A with probability Q, and they talk. Okay, and let's assume that the two grammars are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Let's say they have something in common that there are some sentences there that are mutually compatible. So English and German as the sentences are fine for both, right? Um, so, but let's say big A has some probability of producing a sentence that small a cannot, you know, handle, and small a has some probability of beta um, you know, producing a, a, some expression that big A cannot, you know, handle. B 
Because these weights are P and Q, so therefore the probability of a big A being penalized is going to be exactly the probability of the speaker choosing small a and the, the speaker producing a, a token that a big A cannot handle, so that's uh, beta you know, times Q and also this is alpha you know, times P. Okay? So what are alpha, well, what is alpha and, and, and what is beta? That's essentially a monolingual corpus. So you look at the monolingual corpus of, of, of big A, you count what's the percentage of sentences that big A um, can produce um, that contradicts you know, small a. And that's something that we can all do. Okay, so once you you redo this, you calculate the penalty probability of those two you know, variants. You rewrite the the probabilities of p in the next generation following the equation I showed earlier. You get something like this. Okay, uh, p prime equals p over you know, something else, and this is exactly the equation I showed you earlier for natural selection. Now, if you rewrite s as alpha minus beta over alpha. Okay, so one thing that's clear is that. If big A produces, on average, has um, you know produces more, a higher percentage of tokens that small A cannot handle, counting monolingual corpora, and then big A will always going to kill small A. Okay, so we can now, in principle, we can say we we merge any two grammars together. We can take the two monolingual, you know, corpora and count, and then it makes a prediction. Now the question is, are these predictions true? Okay, so if we plot this out, of course, you get this S-shaped curve, and that's not surprising because we saw the same S-shaped curve in natural selection. Of course, this is something that's observed over and over in the history of, uh, um, in a study of historical linguistics. And this is, you can go, as, you know, you can go a little deeper. You can actually estimate how many generations it takes um, for some change to go from very few in the environment to completion. I won't dwell on the algebra here. This is actually quite, you know, quite straightforward. Is that as long as you can calculate s, as long as you can measure alpha and beta, which will give you s, you can you can assume in the beginning a new variant is very rare, you know, one percent, and the other guy is ninety nine percent. But after some time, um, 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 the new variant is now almost all there is to it, and the old variant is now at point one. And you do this, you can actually estimate the number of generations for change to take place. And that's, of course, as you can imagine, is going to be a function of how better the, the new guy is compared to the old guy, right? If the, big, if, the, if the new guy is much better than the old guy, it'll, it'll kill the old guy faster. So we'll, we'll make use of, uh, of those equations later on. So now the empirical stuff. Okay, so here's a well-known, um, well, very well-studied um, property uh, case in historical linguistics that has to do with the change of word order in the history of French. So French was a V2 language, no longer a V2 language nowadays, so that's modern, not okay, old French is okay. And also old French was a non-subject language, it was a pro-drop language, it's no longer the case now. Okay, so we like to know why it changed. So what's the competition here? So it went from a V2 grammar to a SVO grammar. So these are the two variants that are in competition. Following the logic I was you know, sketching out, we, we can go estimate and the, the alpha and beta in monolingual corpora of V2 and, and SVO uh, you know, languages. So we take something like German or, or English. It doesn't really matter. Um, you found that actually, you know, historically speaking, 70% um, of the V2 languages produce expression of SVO. So these are just fine with the S SVO grammar. It's so the sentence is like with a, a verb in the post um, verbal position that's going to clash with the SVO grammar. That's about 30%. So this is our alpha. Okay. Now what's beta? So what's the percentage of SVO sentences that are in SVO languages, or the sentences produced by SVO grammar that are inconsistent with the V2 grammar, or oh, that's easy to do. Um, we count, you know, English, I count the childish, I count the you know, Wall Street Journal, not a huge amount of difference, is that whenever you have a verb in a non-second position, that's when the V2 grammar fails, right? So SVO is certainly fine for both grammars, but that's our, alpha, that's our beta. So we have alpha being 30% and beta being 10%, so alpha is greater than beta, so that means that change from V2 to SVO shouldn't be possible because V2 is better than SVO when they are put in a 
put in a competition, and that's contrary to the facts. So something else is going on. So what's going on? Well, we should you know, keep in mind that German, uh, French was a pro-drop language. Okay, so if the subject pronoun is dropped, okay, you get something like, um, this would be a sentence that's usually inconsistent with SVO grammar, but if you drop the you know, subject pronoun, it becomes XV. That's consistent with SVO grammar as long as you allow you know, pro-drop, right? So this is the case of, you can post it in the empty category, either to left or, or right side of the verb. Um, now, of course, if you have an SVO sentence, if you give it pro-drop, well, then it actually would amplify the advantage of SVO grammar over V2 because if you drop the subject, the sentence becomes um, V1, which is transparently not V2. Okay? So between the two factors of this double whammy, um, SVO grammar is going to lose out to the... Uh, sorry, the V2 grammar is going to lose out to the SVO grammar. And this is roughly how we do this. Okay, so you have you have subjects. Sometimes they're pronouns. Sometimes they're I mean they're they're lexical NPs. We don't have to you know worry about that. Um, when you have a pronoun, you have a pro-drop language. You have a chance of being dropped. So the probability of you dropping this would be having a pro-drop would be a times d, right? And then uh, this I won't bore you you know with all the details. Basically, you see what are the what you know if you happen to be a lexical uh, you know NP. It, the, I mean, the subject stays. This still goes against uh, uh, SVO grammar. And but if, but crucially here, if you drop the pro, this is no longer inconsistent with SVO grammar. You do the same for the green guys, namely, um, what happens to SVO if you add pro drop to it, and you change the the numbers here slightly. Again, this is pretty straightforward, you know, algebra. We don't have to worry about it, you know, A and D. So now these are revised fitness values of. V2 and prodrop on the one hand, and SVO and prodrop on the other hand. So these are the real, two real grammars that are going through competition. So this will show that loss of V2 would happen if, um, if alpha prime from the previous slides is, 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 is greater than, than beta prime. If you do solve the equation there, you see that if A times D is greater than about 18%, then the V2 grammar will necessarily lose to an SVO grammar. Okay. So, but what is A times D? Well, remember A times D is the percentage of prodrop in Old French. Okay. If you look at um, the, the, the text in 14th century French compiled from you know, Ian Roberts' book, you see that there's over 40% of prodrop patterns um, of the time, you know, at the time. Okay. So this is clearly greater than you know, 18%. So that means that um, the loss of V2 in, in French to SVO was necessary. Okay? And this actually, I think, makes a novel you know, prediction, as far as I know it's true, that is that all Western Romance languages had V2, had, that had V2 order, all of them lost it. Some of them, um, and all of them that lost prodrop, uh, lost V2 had prodrop. Some of them still have prodrop, like Italian or you know, Spanish. Um, so this is actually a prediction you can make on numerical grounds. Okay, I, I didn't know, I still don't know French, old or new, um, but that's a prediction you can make by looking only looking at the numerical basis of, of competition between grammars. We can go slightly um, um, further, okay? So we calculate, now this is just, you know, it's just rewriting what I had earlier, um, and uh, we can calculate S, uh, which is now we, you know, since we know the percentage of um, of um, now subjects is about 42 percent from EM Roberts data, so we can rewrite S as 0.6. So we can actually estimate the number of generations we expect uh, to um, take for V2 to lose out to SVO, and uh, that's about 10 generations. Okay, so I don't know how long do you want to attribute a generation to the um, ancestors, you know, the French, let's say roughly uh, 20 to 30 years. So that means that it takes about, it took about a, well, we expect it to take about 200 to 300 years for the change to go to completion. That's more or less correct. Again, that's a prediction you can make on, uh, on numerical ground. So it's crucial here for the story to work that the loss of pro drop took place later in the history of French. So after V2 was lost, because otherwise it would not be possible. Okay, that's indeed the case because prodrop actually lost was lost 
about two centuries after V2 was completely gone. Okay. So these are, I think, you know, illustrates a set of um, changes um, for which the outcome was entirely predictable on the basis of the in intrinsic properties of grammar and the numerical you know, um, tabulation of, of how often they contradict each other. Okay. So here you could say we're predicting change. Now let's look at the other case I was uh, you know, alluding to. So that change took a few centuries. right? This one took place in probably three to five years. Let's again try to hear this. And this is a right. This is a uh, this is the diagram from the distribution of um, cod cod merger in uh, in North America. The green areas are areas in which the two vowel invariants are the same, and these areas are um, the dots are the two vowels are actually different. So you go to New York City, you can clearly hear the two vowels being uh, the two vowels being different. So here's um, here's a student of of ours who's from Boston. Okay, so this is a guy that actually says the two vowels are the same thing. Um, why mergers are interesting? Well, mergers are very interesting, I think, historically, of course, but also um, more generally. Mergers um, happen, uh, mergers are probably the most documented instance of language change um, um, in all studies. Okay, and that poses an interesting challenge to the view that language functions or changes to facilitate communication. Why would you make two words that previously sound different and make them the same? But this happens all the time, which has actually led to Bill evolved to, to the very strongly anti-functionalist you know, position to language change. Right? And also mergers are generally below the conscious social linguistic evaluation. Okay? So there's some language variation that are quite you know, stigmatized, so you can say that what makes them change is more complex. But these are actually things that are usually below people's awareness. So that gives us a good opportunity to study the factors regarding the change from an internal point of view rather than a social point of view, which is hard to quantify. And mergers and phonemic you know, systems are in general quite fairly early. This is a study, again, uh, in Lebov's work and uh, an extension of his work showing that basically if you don't move to an area by the age of six or seven, you have no chance of picking up the, the really deep um, you know, regional features of the phonemic system. And as I said, mergers among the uh, best documented you know, changes on record. Reversals of mergers are extremely rare if, if it ever happens at all. Okay, you, very often you see a, a, an area where it had two vowels emerge into one. You rarely see a case of an area had one, and one time had two vowels merge into one and go back to two. That, as far as we know, rarely if ever you know, happens. We like to account for that. Um, so this is Dan Johnson's work. It's a, a very detailed sociolinguistic work that should be made. Um, it should be part of the literature on language acquisition. Okay, so there's a case of you know I'm have, I have to resort to colors here because for me the two vowels are the same. So this is the O in D O N, so the male name, and this is the A W the vowel in D A W N the female name, and in Boston the two vowels more or less merge to the D A W N sound. But Rhode Island, as I said, uh, initially had, had the two vowels being the same. Uh, sorry, you, you know, be diff being different. But around 19, um, 19, late 80s and 1990s, there's a lot of migration going from this area to here, largely due to um, you know, job opportunities. Okay, so as a result, the change has sp is spreading from Boston to Rhode Island, or the Rhode Island um, dialect regions. And as is shown you know, earlier, in some families, older siblings still retain their parents' distinct system, but the younger uh, children are actually acquired the newer system. This all happened in the span of three to five years. So this is, uh, has to be learning from peers, namely children with a vowel system, except at home, namely usually learning from their parents um, would interact with the children from a different dialect you know, back background and learn their system. And this is clearly a case of... Uh, of, of influence due to migration. So what we're interested in is, is that what kind of population mixture would it trigger a deep change of the sort that, that we're seeing in, in a span of three to five years? Um, just to hear this again, if you're not convinced, 
I was really stunned when I you know, first heard this because I didn't imagine change would happen so rapidly. Okay, the last one again being the, you know, being the, you know, being the youngest, uh, the youngest speaker. Okay, so children usually learn their parents' distinct, you know, system at home because that's where they're primarily, you know, picking out their language. So let's call this the M minus system. So I, I, if you paid attention to the previous slide, the slides, you know, for the back, the three-year-olds actually pattern like their parents, but once they grow up to be in a school environment, they're actually going to pattern like the, you know, like the peers. Then they run into kids that some of them will speak, be speaking this M plus system, namely the merger has taken place, and they're going to be learning from a, uh, from a mixture of say, P0 and, and Q0, okay? And then, you know, according to the dy dynamics co of competition we had earlier, we need to calculate what's the probability of the merger system failing in this mixture, and what's the probability of the distinct system failing in this mixture? And that will al allow us to calculate the expected rate of P, namely the weight of the merger system, after learning. And since this is a case where apparently children adopt one system rather than having a mixture of two, we're going to pick the one that has a higher value to be the one, namely the one that's better. Um, one, if you're better, you, you actually kill the, the other you know, competitor you know, instantly in one generation rather than you know, letting the competition drag on for, uh, you know, for many years. Again, this is probably a, a fundamentally you know, related to the difference between morphology and syntax on the one hand and phonology and phonemes on the other, um, as, as lots of uh, psycholinguistic and neurolinguistic you know, evidence show. Even for fully fluent bilinguals that require two languages at birth, one phonemic system appears to be somewhat more dominant. Okay, so how, do we, how are we going to define you know, fitness? One of the easy ways to do so is to say, well, let's calculate when, when the two dialects uh, are merged together, let's see uh, what's the probability of leading to miscommunication. So Bill LeBeau has been you know, tracking this for about 30 years. And he reported about 80 cases in the span of 25 years. There's not a whole lot of them, and this is typical. Okay. Gideon Sankoff, my colleague, is from Montreal. In all of Canada, the two vowels are the same. Bill LeBeau is from New Jersey, um, and that he has, and that's, that, that area had two, had a system where the two vowels are different. So here's uh, not a typical conversation, but an amusing one. Uh, you know, Gillian said it would be even better if Don could take her to the airport. So Don is Don Wrench, a, a historical linguist in our, in our department. But when this thing was said, it was about you know, 20 years ago, we had a female a graduate, a graduate student in the department by the name of D-A-W-N, who was actually blind. So Bill LeBeau clearly understood um, D-O-N to be D-A-W-N and was wondering why anyone, why a blind person could take anyone to the airport. Okay, so this is actually a genuine case of, of misunderstanding. If you look at the rates of errors that, um, that Bill you know, collected over the years, they found that actually it's people who have a distinct system that are more easily confused than people with a merger system, but the ratio of four to one. We have something to say about that later on. And the more general consideration, I think, is actually not gross miscommunication, because that happens rarely. Um, 40 instances, 80 instances in, in 25 years is not, that's not a lot. In most cases, you can figure out what the other person you know, is, is trying to say. So I think here the general consideration is actually the ambiguity introduced by competing phonemic systems and the fitness, the confusion they introduce at a very temporal, at, at, very, um, um, at, at a temporal scale, very subliminal, that could actually mislead you know, people. And uh, so this will be something similar to garden path in, in syntax, but this, this will be garden path in phonological um, you know, processing. And there's a variety of psycholinguistic evidence you know, supporting this view. This is one of the you know, earliest studies by David Sweeney, showing that um, highly influential, showing lexical processing at the very initial stage of language processing is highly uh, autonomous, contextual cues um, coming much later. By later, I mean later by 100 milliseconds, but not you know, five seconds. So here's uh, an example. Rumor has it that for years, 
The government building um, had been plagued with problems. The man was not surprised when he discovered several spiders, roaches, and other bugs in a courtroom, uh, in a corner room. So bug, of course, is ambiguous. It could either mean the insect or spy. Okay. So this is a not actually, you know, what they did with in a cross modal, you know, priming in paradigm. They they were the subject heard the sentence, but as soon as the, at the time when bug was uttered, they showed uh, you know pictures of other insect or recording device as as in a spy you know sense, and the speakers actually show equal amount of activation. So that means that when you hear the word bug, even though the context makes very clear, you cannot possibly be be talking about the recording device. The recording device meaning is still activated. Of course, you know, very quickly you figure out that you're talking about the insect. Um, and some, some of the more um, direct you know, evidence comes from more recent work. Um, I won't go through all the details there, but here's a particularly important one. Speakers, uh, or rather listeners, uh, show slowdown as well as errors when they process sentences like, she saw him duck and stumble near the barn. Well, this is very interesting because duck is a, um, the two ducks, right? One is the noun form of the duck, the other is the verb form of the, of the duck. Duck being a noun is much more frequent than, than duck being a verb. So people actually were interpreting initially at, uh, of, of duck being, uh, being, uh, being a noun. This is why they, they have slowed down, because that wouldn't make any, you know, any grammatical sense. Even though the preceding context is very clear, this cannot possibly be a noun. Okay? So this you know, suggests when we process homophones, we actually go for the more frequent form first. Okay, so this is even true regardless of, you know, of even part of speech, okay, because you, are, you should be having a verb here, but you actually hear a noun first. So what this means is the following. Um, if you're in Boston, if you have the merger for caught and caught, if I say something, I slap on the caught. If you have only one vowel, you're actually going to hear the past tense of catch first before you hear the noun form of caught. This is exactly what these results show. This would give us a way to calculate the fitness of the two competing you know, phonemic systems. Okay, so now we have a combination of, let's say you have uh, the speaker, the environment, you know, consists of some people saying the merger, some people not saying the merger. The learner sometimes will try out the merger system, sometimes will try out the distinct systems. So we have four possibilities. And what's interesting here is that we're going to calculate the expected probability of a particular phonemic system misleading the learner however some minimally, um, you know, temporarily, and we're going to calculate the probabilities and calculate the penalty probabilities, and then we will see that one that's penalized less is going to win. Okay, the crucial data here is actually have, are, the folk, are the homophones that may result from the, the caught, caught merger, things like these. I won't you know, read them out you know, for you. So we can estimate the frequencies of these words as reliably as we want. And I tried uh, you know, several different uh, you know, frequency counts. They don't seem to you know, matter very much. So here's one scenario. Okay? So this is what happens if the learner is trying to merge um, you know, uh, trying to merge a system, namely the, the system to, uh, under which the COD and COD are the same. Sometimes it's going to hear you know, speakers um, using a merger. Sometimes it's going to uh, hear you know, speakers not using the merger, namely using a distinct you know, system. Let's just say, uh, without loss of any uh, in generality, let's assume D-O-N to be more frequent than D-A-W-N. So what I mean you know, by here is that if a merger you know, speaker is saying uh, DOM as intending to mean DOM, okay, and uh, if, you are, if you are um, using the merger phoneme system, you're going to hear the two words to be the same. And because D-O-N is more frequent than D-W-N, so if it's actually intended to be D-O-N, you will be right. But if it's intended to be D-A-W-N, um, you will be wrong. Okay, because D-O-N is more frequent than, than D-A-W-N. This is also the case here. So here, even though the speaker is producing two acoustically, uh, potentially two acoustically di di you know, distinct words, you can only hear one of them because you have the merger, or you're trying out the merger. So again, um, even though um, this is the sound of DAON is actually different from DAWN, uh, but when it's intended, you will actually will, you would get it right because you always hear the more frequent one first. So therefore, if you use a merger system, 
the probability of you fading would be the smaller of the of the frequencies of the of those minimal pairs over all minimal pairs. So that's an expected probability of fading when you, when you have a merger system. Now the our merge system is different. It's somewhat more complex. So you hear two vowels. You hear O and also a W, but they're actually psychoacoustically you know confusable to to you know to some extent. So this goes back to you know Peterson and Barney. Uh, roughly, um, a, a W can be you know, perceived as O with probably a one with point one, and this goes the other way with probably a point six. So this needs a little more you know thinking. Uh, so here you you can you can hear two vowels, okay? And uh, again, you sometimes hear from murder speakers. Sometimes you, uh, you hear from you know, distinct uh, um, you know, speakers. So here is if you hear from murder speaker and D A, that sometimes is intended to be D O N, sometimes intended to be D A W N. Uh, and here, but but again, those two vowels are, have have been merged by the murder speaker, so the two words are acoustically the same. Okay, so you actually hear D O N. You actually hear. D A W N because this is an area where O and A W have merged to you know A W, so basically you know if you actually mishear A W as O, you actually get right. Um, okay, so if you actually you know mishear A W as O, you actually when it's intended to be Don, the male you know, name, you're actually okay. Otherwise, of course, you fail. So all the rest is is about the same. You can plug in all, all those numbers. All those are presumably constants. We assume the psychoacoustic confusability are inherent properties of the of the speech and also perception system. We assume them to be constant. We also assume word frequencies to be constant. So what you have here is now is it, you know is interesting. So the parity probability of the distinct system is actually going to be a function of the frequencies of speakers, merger speakers in the environment. So compare this uh, with the previous slide here. So this is a constant. So this is only a function of, uh, of word frequencies. But the next slide shows that this is the fitness of the merger uh, of the distinct system is actually going to be a function of how many, what's a percentage of murder, murder you know, speakers you have in the environment. All the frequencies here are constants because we're talking about the frequencies you know, of words. So this in biology is known as something as frequency independent selection, namely the fitness of competing variants is a function of their of their frequencies. It typically happens, say, um, in you know, very common in a competition um, in, when you in in a, in a population with very few males. Initially, they may have a huge advantage, but as the number of males increase, then you know their fitness you know value would go down because the competition gets more gets more fierce. It could be also you know other sort of uh, resource uh, you know, driven competition. So now, so unlike the French case where alpha and beta are constants, here the fitness values are actually sensitive to their frequencies. So therefore, we can actually calculate what's the percentage of p zero, what's the value of p zero such that c minus is going to be greater um, than c plus. To solve that equation, that's going to tell us the exact you know, percentage of merger speakers in a population that's going to make the merger kill the Distinct system. It's it's a linear equation, so it's easy to solve. It's 22 percent. Okay, so this is calculated on only on the basis of word frequency and psycho, uh, uh, you know, acoustic measures of vowel you know, confusability. So that means that if you have over 20 percent of of kids in the environment that speak the merger, everybody will learn the merger. If any, if you have a frequency of under 20. 2% of the kids in the environment that speak the merger, then those kids would actually lose a merger to the distinct, you know, to, to the distinct you know, system. This is actually what happened, you know, believe it you know, or not. So Dan Johnson, in his uh, very careful uh, study interviewing uh, thousands you know, of subjects, described you know, three stages. Not many, the first stage is not many merged parents in a you know, community. A small number of merged children will learn the distinction from their peers. And second stage, more merged parents have moved in. The proportion of natively merged children entering the peer group not enough to stop natively distinct children remaining distinct. Finally, the proportion of native merged children exceed Y, he posted a threshold. And while distinct children may not be in a minority, they have enough contact with the merged peers that they lose their distinct inherited in distinction. So it's 22 percent. So let's see if, you know, if, if this is right. Um, the, 
the towns that you know he's looking at, some of them reached the the threshold. Uh, reached stage three, namely everybody you know, became merged. Some of them by uh, 1990, some of them by 2000. 2000, the SP actually got the data for, um, got the demographic data for, as I show here. What he found is that children, he he said he he noted that children with one merged parent, one distinct parent, were usually merged. This would not be surprising because if 22%, if you primarily learn from your parents, and you only need 20% of the tokens be coming from the merged you know, parent, that's enough for you to learn the merger. Let's assume that one of the parents isn't exactly mute, and that's enough for, um, for, the, for this generalization to be true. In his you know, school survey, this is, I, this is what I thought was pretty you know, compelling. So he went to the exact time when uh, went to the school board and found the de demographic data of where they were born, the children were born, exactly the time when merger knocked out the distinct you know, system. He found that at the time, the the percentage of children from the, from the Boston you know, area was at the 18 to 23 percent, which is very similar to the 22 percent that we have calculated on purely on numerical basis. Okay, this is more advanced here. Of course, this is the, the, the thing that's already you know, taking place, and you have, of course, you see you have a higher ratio of merged kids. And more broadly, um, this also accounts for the asymmetry of errors in uh, Lavolve's natural, you know, miscommunication, um, you know, studies. Um, in most cases, uh, you know, you even you hear a slap on the cot, you hear past tense of catch. Um, you know, in many cases, it won't cause any confusion. It's only those rare cases when you happen to know both down and down in the same department, you have the confusion. But it's, but it's very interesting is that um, it's the merger is people with with a distinct system that's more likely to be penalized, more likely to be confused. And this makes sense because if you use a merger system, you're always going to hear the, the most frequent one. Okay, you only fail when you hear the least frequent one of those minimal pairs. So that inherently gives you an advantage. Um, and this also accounts for the easy, you know, spreadability of the merger. Um, so this, uh, so this is something that uh, you only need a quarter of the population, under a quarter of the population, to sweep out the um, the distinct, you know, system. This has been documented both in Massachusetts as well as in Pennsylvania, um, when we have studies of looking at Western Pennsylvania mining towns in the 1920s had a traditionally a distinct system. But due to the migrant workers, I think from a Slavic background, who actually learned the merger system in the Boston area, they moved there, and in, in the span of 10 years, all those towns are actually merged. You only need a you know, small ratio you know, of that. With, it probably also accounts for that um, the large cities have been very resistant to the merger, because um, it's easy to move 20 people into a town of 80. It's very difficult to move two million people into a, into a city of ten million. Okay, so it's not impossible. It's just demographically much less likely. Um, and finally, even the mutual inconfusibility of the vows is not hugely important because, again, if you have a merger system, you only fail when you encounter the, the least frequent of the minimal pairs. Okay, so here's a case you can look, we can look in the south where there's a well-known um, uh, um, you know, variation um, in South American English known as a ping pen merger. So the two vowels are actually now in the south no longer the same. This only happens in front of nasals. Okay, so we have the same dynamics. We do the same calculation by using different set of words, different frequencies, and also different measures of vowel uh, you know, confusibility. And we get about 32% you know, of speakers the have the merger would trigger this um, wholesale change, um, and uh, we don't have the detailed, you know, data, you know, on, on this. But this is the work from uh, dialect, you know, surveys from the uh, 18, uh, from the 1800s and also early 19, uh, you know, hundreds. You can see it start out very flat, then it just shot up. Okay, so this we we can't exactly say this is actually, uh, you know, 33 percent, but this was. Uh, uh, was triggered by um, this feature has always been been, been a rural um, dialect you know feature, but when around this time people were starting to move into big cities, and uh, even a small uh, you know fraction of the speakers can actually lead to massive changes. So in a span of about 30 years, the entire South changed from the distinct you know, system to the merger system. Okay, I should I should I should wrap things up. Um, 
Um, what we want to conclude today, um, I think in a narrow sense, is that uh, we like to study biolinguistics, and to, to, to do that, we have to study biology quite seriously. And biology relies on quantitative models. So we have to develop quantitative models that make, that, that make predictions. Right? And of course, that's what linguists have been doing all along. Um, and models, of course, can guide work on language variation change and processing, you know, acquisition and so on, um, and can, can sharpen our, uh, our work. And the models actually here are simple. Okay? Everything I've shown today are really high school you know, algebra stuff. And even the more, more advanced Jungian topics here were developed by biologists by the 1960s. So there's no new math to do. Um, but it's crucial that we take the linguistic factors into account. How language is processed, how language is learned, how language is also structured. Because otherwise the model would be, just, would be toys and it won't have any empirical content. Um, so this is something I think we might want to say more broadly in the context of language, uh, language, revolu uh, language revolution is that change and variation appear to be governed by, you know, by learning you know, and processing. So you can think of UG you know, came out of Africa and then we marched it to the places. We have this diversity of, you know, of languages. Uh, at least some of the patterns can be pinned down to the inherent properties of language learning and language processing. And some of them appear to be modular. So the processing of phonological information in lexical processing appears to take place regardless of what the syntax or semantics or pragmatic context is that really takes, um, and that's somewhat surprising. Okay? And in, as, as also in the case of, of language learning, I think the model of learning I'm showing you today is you know, derived from mathematical psychology of you know, rodents. So that's a very ancient learning scheme. Um, so it's possible that these are the interface conditions that we entertain, and they may actually tell us something interesting about the diversity and change of languages around us. Thank you. <laughs>